Good, 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 good. It is a joy uh, to gather as, uh, as God's people, um, to pray, to sing, uh, to open up his, his word uh, so that we might uh, get to know more of who our Father is, who is seated in heaven, uh, who is fully in control and who loves us more than we could ever imagine. And we know this to be true because of the finished work of Jesus. Uh, now, I know some of you, if you've been coming for a while, you're like, oh, man, you say that a lot. Um, I say it a lot because I believe it. I believe it to be true. Um, and I also say it a lot because we are forgetful people. And oftentimes we'll find ourselves wandering to places where uh, we believe that that is not true, uh, that we are not loved, that God is not powerful, that he is not seated on his throne. Um, and yet uh, there is so much in my life and so much in uh, many of your lives that shows, that displays uh, that, no, he is. Uh, he is a good father um, who is powerful, powerful and also loving. Uh, and so I, I greet you with that spirit, with that heart, and with that excitement. Um, like Jonah said, my name is uh, One. For those who maybe I haven't met or um, we haven't gotten the opportunity to uh, face-to-face engage one another, um, I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at, uh, at Rooted Fellowship. And uh, it is a, a privilege, a great privilege and a great joy when I don't take for granted. Uh, we are currently in the book of Ephesians. Um, and uh, it's been incredible, absolutely incredible. God has just revealed so much of himself uh, in fresh ways, um, ways that have stirred my heart and I know have stirred many of your hearts uh, as I've gotten to hear some feedback from some of you. It's amazing how you can go back to passages that you've read uh, over and over and over again and yet God reveals something new, something fresh, something that we might have missed. Uh, It just kind of tells us that God is endless, uh, that we can never uh, get enough of him. Um, and uh, he reveals himself uh, through his word. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 17 to 32. That's where we'll be uh, this morning. Um, And and I said this last week, uh, that the the book of Ephesians uh, is split into two, if you will. Um, The first three chapters is where Paul, uh, writing to the church in Ephesus, right? And uh, he's basically just unpacking the gospel. He's going, hey guys, here's what the gospel is. Uh, And he wants it to be so clear in the minds and the hearts of those who are hearing this, um, because he wants them to be gripped by the gospel, in a sense, to cross the line of faith. Uh, That's how we like to say it here at Rooted Fellowship, to surrender their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so he wants that to be absolutely clear, and he does that in various ways in the first three chapters. And then from uh, chapter 4 onwards, he goes, okay, now now that you have been gripped by the truth of the gospel, here are its implications in your life where you live, work, and play. Uh, I said it last week that despite what people say, uh, there is a Christian lifestyle. Uh, That is a real thing. There is a way that Christians are to live, uh, and, and we can judge one another. Uh, because it's revealed to us here. We can look at one another's lives and go, hey, you say you're a Christian, but you're not living like one. Uh, We saw this last week where uh, Paul says that we are to walk uh, in a manner that is worthy to the the calling that we have received, Uh, that there is a way that we should live because the gospel is in our hearts. It flows within us we should be able to see the fruit of that in the way that we live. And so we're going to continue in that this morning. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 to 32, Paul just continues to lay out more implication, implication after implication after implication of, hey, if you say you're a Christian, then these are the things that you should see, and then these are the things that shouldn't be in your life. And so before we jump into the text by way of preaching, Uh, For those who can, I would encourage you to stand uh, as we read the text uh, together this morning. And so what I'll do is I'll just simply read it uh, to to you. Feel free if you want to read with me and read out aloud, go ahead. If you don't, that's totally fine. Uh, And then what I'll do is I'll pray. I'm going to pray for you. I ask that you pray for me, uh, that God would do that which only he can do. And that is save many, heal many, restore many for his glory and for our joy. And so hear these words of our Father. Therefore, I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer live as the Gentiles live in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity of the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. 
But that is not how you came to know Christ. Assuming you heard about him and were taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus. To take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth. Each one to his neighbor because we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. No foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of your of redemption. Let all bitterness and anger and wrath, shouting and slander be removed from you along with all malice and be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another just as God also forgave you in Christ. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. These are old and ancient words, but they are not dead words. They are alive. They are active. They engage us where we are. And so Holy Spirit, would you meet all of us where we are? Many of us have walked in, maybe wrestling with a bunch of things, unsure about the next step to take. And so, God, I pray that you would meet us where we are, that, that we would be still before you so that we might hear from you. I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy, to distract, to bring about confusion and division. I ask that you would come and give life and give it to the full. Use me as an instrument in your hand. And so it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. Lord, may the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. There is a Christian lifestyle. For those who've crossed the line of faith, if you've been declared righteous, you are right with God, not because of what you have done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. And so therefore, we should live righteously. We should live in a way that is pleasing to God, that, that becomes a sweet fragrance to Him. And that's what Paul lays out to us here in these verses. He says, therefore, Right? Therefore, in light of the gospel, therefore I say this and testify in the Lord that these are not his words but God's words. He says, you should no longer live as the Gentiles live. Now, if you've been following with us these last few weeks, upon reading that, it should make you feel some way. You should no longer live as the Gentiles live. It's like, Paul, hold on. Uh, it was just a couple of chapters ago in chapter 2 where you said to us that no, 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 because of what Jesus has accomplished on the cross, there's now no uh, wall of hostility anymore, no dividing wall of hostility. Uh, Jews and Gentiles are now one body and that we should celebrate this. And then the very next chapter, uh, you, you say to us that you are in prison on behalf of the Gentiles. I can imagine a Gentile hearing these words and going, man, this is good news. Paul is for us. God is for us. And then he says here, you should not live as the Gentiles live. He goes on, he says, in the futility of their thoughts, they are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. Paul, what on earth is going on here? Now, now, now before we, we think, no, Paul maybe doesn't quite understand what he's writing here. Uh, here's what Paul wants us to understand. When he talks about the Gentiles in Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 3, he's referring to them ethnically. Ethnically. But when he speaks of them here, he, he's referring to them ethically. Now, let me say that again, because I know you might go, oh, that sounds very similar. You're saying the same thing. Are you trying to confuse us? No, 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 no. There's a difference between ethnically and ethically. Ethnically, he's like, no, 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 there's... You're in. 
whether you're black or, or brown or white, wh whether you're Zulu or Tswana or English, whether you're from the Northern Hemisphere or the Southern Hemisphere, if you surrender your life to Jesus, you're in. You're a child of God. But there are some things that you do ethically, ethically, ethically. It's a, a standard of living a practice, uh, the, the things that become custom in your culture or family or ethnicity. And he says, no, those things we need to address. Th those things we need to talk about, but ethnically, no, 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 no. This is why he can say in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, that there is neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. Now, some people have taken that verse to go, yeah, 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 this is why there should be no gender roles in the church. This, this is why that, that we should be colorblind. No, no, no. He, he's not referring to that. He's talking about salvation here. That when it comes to salvation, it doesn't matter where you come from. If you surrender your life to Jesus, you're in. You're a child of God. But it doesn't take away the color of your skin, your culture, your language, your tribe. It doesn't take away those things. But what we do is we bring those things to God and we surrender them to him because ethnically, we are in, but ethically there are some things that God needs to work on. And so that's what he's saying here. He says, don't, don't, don't live like the Gentiles ethically in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their hearts, the futility of their thoughts. Now look, um, when I read this, I was like, mm, futility, this is not a word that I use in everyday conversation. Maybe you do, but I don't. I don't walk around going, well, the futility of the economic downturn has... I, I, ju I just don't talk like that. So it made me wonder, what is futility? What, what is that? Is there, is, there, is there other words that we could use that maybe say the same thing but kind of help us understand what Paul is saying here? Well, they are. Let me replace this word futility with some words that maybe we'll better understand. In the fruitlessness of their thoughts, in the pointlessness of their thoughts, in the uselessness of their thoughts. That they are things that we do that, that, that to us, this side of heaven, separated from the kingdom of God, they look like, man, these are some really good things. But when you compare them to the way that God calls us to live, they are fruitless, useless, pointless. And Paul finds it necessary to tell us about these things because many of us will find ourselves grinding at things that have no eternal value. No eternal value. You'll be celebrated here, but in the kingdom of God, everyone's going, what on earth are you doing? Why did you do that? Why did you put so much energy and passion and resources into that? It's fruitless. And he says, don't, don't live like that. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God. Um, uh, let me give an illustration here. Uh, how many of you have been to the bush? Okay, great. I'm talking about the deep, deep, deep bush deep, 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 where at night the only thing that is present is you, the bush, the stars, and the sounds of animals that are seeking to devour you. I'm talking the deep, deep bush. It's dark there at night. Dark. But here's what happens. When you're there for an extended period of time, your eyes begin to adjust to the darkness. They begin to adjust to the darkness. And now you find yourself going, I was once uncomfortable, but now I'm kind of okay because I can see what's around me. You're still in the darkness. See, P Paul is saying, before you, you, you cross the line of faith, before you surrender your life to Jesus, you are in the darkness. Spiritually, you are in the darkness. We covered this a couple of weeks ago where we spoke about what, uh, what, what Christians refer to as total depravity. That you are in a pit that is completely dark. There is no good there. But you might go, okay, oh, now I hear you, but I still feel like I'm okay. Well, it's because your eyes have just adjusted to the darkness. You're not okay. You need a savior. You need someone to reach into the depth of that pit and pull you out because on your own you cannot. That's the gospel. And, and so Paul is going, so because you've been transformed by the gospel, don't, don't live like that. Don't live like that. Because of the ignorance that is in them. Now, when I became a Christian, and I read that passage for the first time, it just it didn't gel with me very well. I, I was like, mm, 
I don't like that. Ignorance, ignorance. Because my understanding of ignorance is, is the truth has been made known to me, but I am denying it. I don't want to believe it. Therefore, I'm being ignorant to the truth. And so when I read it, I was like, but there's some people who, who don't know the truth. How could, how could they be ignorant? How can you call them ignorant? They haven't heard of Jesus. Well, the reason Paul comfortably uses that word is because he says in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, hear this, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Okay, I get that. Ignorance, suppressing the truth. Now hold on, verse 19. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. W- w- wait, what? I thought, I thought they, don't, they haven't heard the name Jesus. Verse 20. Forever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so they have no excuse for not knowing God. Paul says that we should be able to, to look to the stars, to, to, to understand the universe the way that we do. It's depth and breadth and width. That we are to, to look to nature and go, wow, the, just the way things work, the fact that we, we sit where we sit in, in a line of planets and the sun is where it is and the fact that our heart is, literally, if my heart was five centimeters to the left or the right, I'd have a massive heart condition. He's saying we should be able to look to these things, to, to the ocean and how deep it goes, the, the, the unknown things that dwell there and are able to live. We should be able to look at those things and go, you know what? There is a creator here. There just has to be. There has to be something way more powerful and way more sovereign than my imagination can comprehend and then search for that. But we don't. We see all of that and we suppress the truth by coming up with our own ideas. This is why he says, we we actually have no excuse. No excuse. Now, this doesn't take away the fact that we are called to share Jesus everywhere. That's just, that's part of God's saving grace that, that he gives us all of this, but still on top of that, he goes, and I'm going to send the church to go and talk about me. And so we have no excuse. Paul says, don't be ignorant. Don't be ignorant like them. Verse 19, they became callous. Callous. It's, um, I don't do uh, hard manual labor, though my wife would love for me uh, to do that. But I I just tell her that that's not my gift. It's not my spiritual gift. Um, My spiritual gift is hiring those who are gifted to do that kind of work, right? But, 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 I'm sure many of you who do, you work outside, you work in the garden, um, construction, you're just a handy person. Over time, you'll notice that your hands form this extra layer of skin. It's a callus. It's because you're working your hands, and, and so over time, the body goes, I need to protect myself, and so it forms this extra layer of skin. I don't know if you've ever uh, shaken the hand of someone who has a ton of those. It's like, it's like, it's just rough. It's like, what is, go- what is going on here? Paul uses that as an illustration to say, listen, their hearts, it's, it's like they've, they've formed callus around it. It's hardened now. They've s- suppressed the truth so much that the, now their hearts are just hard. And, and, and it can get to a point in your life where, where you just no longer feel anything anymore. You, you cry out, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. But you're living this way, and, 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 and so you just you don't feel it anymore. You can look at injustice and go, mm, it's not my problem. You, you can look at, 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 at poverty and, 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 and abuse and, 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 and all the evils of the world, not only out there, but even in your own life, and just go, I, I, just, I don't feel it anymore. Not my problem. None of my business. Paul says, don't, don't, don't live like that. You've been transformed by the gospel. Don't, don't live like that. They became callous and gave themselves over 
to promiscuity, the practice of every kind of impurity with the desire for more and more. You just keep going back to it. Despite the fact that it hurts you. Despite the fact that it leaves you in a place of, of loneliness and frustration and depression, you just want to go back for more and more because you believe the lie that it will fulfill you. Those things will not and cannot fulfill you. Just can't. So Paul is saying, don't, don't, don't. And for those who've crossed the line of faith, we don't live like that anymore. We don't. How come? I'm glad you asked. Because of the gospel. Because of the good news of Jesus, the gospel. The gospel has made us new people. I am a new person because of the gospel. Not, not a nice person. Friends, the world does not need more nice people. We don't. We need new people who've been transformed by the gospel. That's what we need. And so because of the gospel, I... I, I don't live like that anymore. I'm a new person because I've been saved by the power and the grace of the gospel. Paul says, you know Christ now. You know Christ. Verse 20, but that is not how you came to know Christ. You see, to know Christ is not just to be aware of Jesus, but it's to understand and experience Jesus. To know and understand and experience the gospel, his life, death, and resurrection. It's to, to know and to experience. Uh, Kenny preached on this a couple of weeks ago. It's not about just being enlightened, but it's also about being empowered. There is a difference. There are tons of people who know about Jesus. But we need to know and experience. Our lives need to be anchored in who he is, the person and the power of Jesus. And it will lead us to, to live a life that, that glorifies our Father who is in heaven. Because here's the thing, Jesus didn't just save you. And then now you can go and do whatever you want. Many of us live that way. We've believed that theology. He saves me and then it's all about me. Right? It's how I want to live. It's my truth. You want to know the, the most dangerous word that you can put in front of truth? My. My truth. No, no. There's only God's truth. That's it. And so God saves you, but then he, he, also, he owns you. He saves you to own you. Th this is why we, I'm surrendering my life to him. And in life is included my ambitions, my desires, my passions, my resources, my everything. God not only just saves you, but he, he owns you. I belong to him. And we need this. We need this to be true so that we might live for Jesus. So that we might live for Jesus. To live for him, we must be born again. We must be born again. And, and, and you, can't, you can't skip this process. So many of us try. This is why we wonder why things just aren't coming together. Hold on, pause for a moment and ask the simple question, have I given my life to him completely? Am I truly born again? Otherwise, nothing, nothing will work. Nothing will work. To expect a change of life without rebirth is like expecting something to grow out of concrete. And we can throw everything at it. Our resources, our energy, our passions, everything and stand back and nothing happens. And then we get frustrated. We get frustrated at, at God. We get frustrated at God's people. We get frustrated at ourselves. But rebirth hasn't happened. It hasn't happened. And so we must be transformed by the gospel. This is what Paul means when he refers to knowing Christ. But this is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. The truth is in Jesus. Not, not, not in you, but in, in Jesus. But if Jesus lives in you, then yes. And so the question is, does he live in you? Verse 22. To take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness 
in righteousness and purity of the truth. What Paul is doing here in these verses is he's presenting to us the gospel. That's what he's doing. It's, it's like Paul just, he's so blown away by the gospel, but it, I mean, it literally drips everywhere in all he's writing. He'll talk about some issues and then right there he'll go, gospel. Oh, there's some issues around marriage. Okay, guys, here's actually how you should treat one another, husbands and wives. Oh, pff, gospel. It's because he's so blown away by it. And so here, he, when he says, don't live like the Gentiles, that, that there is a Christian lifestyle, there is a way to live. Oh, but if it's going to happen, you need the gospel. And so he, he lays it in there. He, he says that we are to take off, take off our former way of life. Take off the old self so that we might put on the new self. That's the gospel, friends. That's the gospel. And, and the beautiful thing about the gospel is that, is that it, once it's done, it's done. Once saved, always saved. It's not a take off, put on, oh, take off, put on, take off, put on. No, 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 no. If you have truly taken off and truly put on, you are saved. It is done. It is finished, like Jesus says on the cross. Finished. But it leaves us wondering, if that's the case, then why do I still find myself doing things that I shouldn't be doing. If, if there's a new self that I have now put on, then, then why? Why? On it? Why do I find myself doing the things I shouldn't be doing? Well, let me go back to the gospel again and then try to unpack it. Because I want us to truly, 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 truly understand that, that, that once saved, always saved. Ezekiel 36 verse 26 says this, And I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you a tender, responsive heart. This is how we know that the, that the, the taking off and putting on is a one and done. Is that what happens is God goes, I'm taking out this old, stony, stubborn heart that only suppresses the truth. And I'm going to put in you a new heart. One that is responsive to the spirit. So once your heart is in, it's in, it's done. It's done. But, but I still find myself doing the things I shouldn't be doing. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7. Why? Why, if I've taken off those, those clothes, if you will, because those clothes are worn by dead people, and I am not dead anymore because I have a new heart, a living heart. So I've taken off those clothes, I've laid them aside, and now I have put on new clothes. Why? Why do I still find myself sinning and being disobedient? Well, well, here's what I believe happens. See, we know that there is a new heart in us. We know that we've put on new clothes. But every now and then, we'll find ourselves walking towards where the, the, the clothes that belonged to a dead person, where they lay, we'll go there and, and we'll look and we'll reminisce. We'll, we'll remember, oof, but it, it, it did make me feel good. Even if it was temporary, it, it made me feel good. Guys, you know that sin, sin, sin makes us feel good. That's why it's temptation. If it didn't make us feel good, it wouldn't be tempting. But the thing about it is that it cannot give us what only Jesus can. It is not fulfilling. It is not satisfying. It leaves us, as it says here, going back for more and more and more more pain, more frustration, more depression. But, but we'll remember that mm, it felt so good in the beginning. And so we'll go back and, and, and then we'll pick up the old jacket, a dead man's jacket. We'll pick up a dead woman's skirt we'll, we'll, and we'll try to put them on just to try to remember, just to try to reminisce, but we'll find that it doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't fit anymore. You'll try, but, but, but why? It's because you're a new creation. You've put on new clothes. The old don't fit anymore. And, and there's a part of that that we know. If we're being honest, we know. But still, still, we'll be like, oh, but, but, but man, it was, that party was good, or, 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 or that, that, that guy made me feel so good, and, 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 but when I held on to that money and, 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 and did not give as I was supposed to, it made me feel so good because I could do for myself. Here's why. John 
says this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. He talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Look, we have a new creation. That's 100% true. But, 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 but everything else, it's, it needs to be molded and shaped and transformed to be made more and more like Jesus. And, and that one day, one day, I will no longer struggle with these things. But until that day, i got to press forward and trust Jesus that he's working in me because I have a new heart. But I still have the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. And it will do everything in my power or in its power to keep me from enjoying the goodness of who God is. And that's why I find myself every now and then going back. But I, the, the jacket doesn't fit. The skirt doesn't fit. The dress doesn't fit. And so what do I do? I begin to, to, to rip the sleeves off the jacket. And then go, because the jacket won't fit, but let me take the sleeves and, 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 and form it into maybe a wristband and just accessorize with it. Or maybe I'll take the, the elastic band from the, the skirt and go, because the skirt doesn't fit me anymore because I've got new clothes because I'm a new creation, but mm, I still want a little bit of that life. And so I'll take that elastic band from the skirt and maybe form a nice little scarf just to accessorize with it. Now, now friends, I'm no fashionista. I mean, I can put things together, and it's really easy when... <laughs> You open your cupboard and you just have black, blue, white, and maybe a shade of this and that. But that's it, right? So I can, I can do it. But I'm no fashionista. But I know when you've got new clothes on and you're accessorizing with a, a dead person's clothes, it's not a good look. It's just not a good look. New heart, new clothes, but you're walking in here with a little bit of lust on your wrist. A little bit of pride around your neck. You've adorned your ears with a little bit of greed. It is not a good look. And that is not how we were called to live. It's because of the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life that, that we have an enemy. And we're going to get to that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, that we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Don't make the mistake to think that, the, that the, you don't have an enemy. You do does not want you to enjoy all that God has called you to. And so we need to turn away from those old clothes, recognizing that I have a new heart and I'm clothed in new clothing and live the way that God has called me to. But how do I do that? H how? H how do we do that in the world that we live in with all its temptations coming at me? You don't have to go very far. You leave this building, get in your car, get onto Instagram and boom! Boom! Oh, I wish I had that. I'd be so much happier if I had that house. If I had that body, if I had that man or that woman. If I had a little bit more, if I'd, I'd be, my life would be way better. Like, like you just, you're drawn into it. And so how, and how then do I keep away from trying to accessorize with a dead person's clothes? Verse 24 says, and to, or verse 23 says, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind. To be renewed in the spirit of your minds. I find it interesting that, that when P Paul talks about not living like the Gentiles, he, he, he says he, he uses thought, understanding, and ignorance. Where does that all happen? In the mind. In the mind. Your heart is new, but your heart needs to activate your mind so that you live a godly life. Your mind needs to be renewed. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. M many of us think that worship is just when we sing on a Sunday. That, that's why we'll show up here and we'll go, whoever's up here, man, they better lead well. Because I've only got two hours in my entire week to worship God. And yet here it says to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Wherever your body goes, you worship. Wherever you live, work, and play, you worship. Do not be conformed to this age. What he's saying is don't copy the behavior and customs of this world. But be transformed by the 
renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. Trying to figure out what the perfect will of God is? You need to renew your mind so that you can discern what is good and pleasing and perfect. We've got to renew our minds. And how do we do that? By immersing ourselves in the things of God. That's how we do it. Immersing ourselves in the things of God. And as this happens, we begin to see things differently. We begin to see things from a kingdom perspective because our minds are being renewed. It's through the immersing of oneself in the word of God. I want to know about God. Where can I go? Right here. Right here. It's interesting that so many of us will do this. We'll go, here's, here's the Bible, here's God's word. And then we'll walk away from it and we'll go, God, speak to me. Now, I'm not saying that God can't do that. God can do whatever he wants. But he's given us his word. God hasn't just spoken. He's still speaking. And so we immerse ourselves in his word so that we, our minds may be renewed so that we can live godly lives. There's no shortcuts. There's no magical formula. We must fill our minds with God's word. Friends, Jesus prayed this. In John 17, verse 17, he says, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Set them apart by the truth. Your word is truth. Mold them and shape them to become more and more like me, Jesus says. How? By your word, which is truth. And so the question is, are you spending time in God's word? Are you immersing yourself in God's word? Are you renewing your mind? Or are you going to other places hoping that it'll do that renewal work for you? If you are, that's why you look like the world. That's why many churches look exactly the same as the culture and society we're no different because we're going to the same place for renewal. But we are to immerse ourselves in the things of God. And, and here's, here's, here's an amazing, really cool thing. Is that this renewal work happens in the context of community. This, this renewing work happens in the context of community. So many of us, we go, no, 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 this is an a independent, me only, by myself thing. And so we, we treat this renewing work like, like going to a restaurant and instead of sitting in, we get a takeout and we go home and we enjoy it in the comfort of our living room by ourselves. Where God's renewing work is communal. You go to the restaurant with a bunch of friends and you sit at a table together. Now, now, now this, this is uncomfortable and many times it's inconvenient I'll be the first one to say it. It is way easier for me to, on my phone, Uber the food to my place. It just is. I don't have to deal with traffic. I don't have to deal with face masks and trying to, like, I would like, I don't know, 12 wings. How many wings? Burger, no, 12 wings. Ah, this mask. I don't have to deal with that. I don't have to deal with, with sitting with people and waiting. And, and You know that message, guys, I'm on my way. And, and can, can we just be honest? We know, when you send that message, we know that you're still at home, <laughs> right? But you, but you play around. Maybe, maybe like you studied law and you're like, well, I'm not lying because mentally I am on my way. I just need my body to catch up with what's going on here. Like, but, but we know you're still at home. No, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. I got to deal with that. Then I got to deal with uncomfortable conversations. Because I know what's going on in your life, but you're pretending and performing, and so you're telling us a different story, but now it's weird, and you're not talking to this person, and this person thinks this, and now they've spoken to me and made a comment on Facebook that like, you don't really need to be like a wizard to decipher that you're talking about that person. Like it's, I don't know if I can just be at home and enjoy my wings on my own. But that's not how the renewing of one's mind works. God's designed it to happen in the context of community. We were designed for fellowship. Desi beautifully designed for fellowship. It's, it's a communal thing. A and what I love about 
Paul is that he always kind of uses illustrations that are in the context of community. All the time. He goes, hey, the gospel does this, and here's what you need to do to make sure that you're growing in Jesus, that you're being molded and shaped to become more and more like him. Okay, here's how it plays itself out in the context of community. A new heart that activates a renewing mind leads to a godly life. Verse 25, he says, Therefore, putting away lying, speak the truth. Some of y'all are already like, ah, you got me right out the gates. Because you're a liar. I'm a liar. And, and I find myself in positions where, 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 where I need to speak the truth, but I will lie because I don't want people to think less of me. I, I want to, to, to keep up this appearance. Or maybe I want to manipulate the situation for my favor. But if you have a new heart, if you are clothed in the newness of Christ, then speak the truth. Stop lying. It's not about what other people think of you. It's about what your father thinks of you. And you are loved more than you could ever imagine. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of the finished work of Jesus. God looks at you and he sees his son Jesus in you and he goes, mine. Oh, but God, you don't know what I did six months ago. Mm, I do. And I still sent my son Jesus to die for you. And if you surrender your life to him, you're mine. For some of us, it's not about six months ago. It's about what happened last night. The lust of the eye. The lust of the flesh, the pride of life. But he looks at you and he says, mine, I've forgiven you. I've forgiven you. So stop lying. We don't need to. Speak the truth, each one to his neighbor, because we are members of one another. This comes from last week. Remember, we are one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, Father of all. So speak the truth to one another. Verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Whoa. Is that a typo? No. You can be angry. There are things that happen in this world that should cause us to to look at them and go, uh, no. The Bible calls that a righteous anger. It's a righteous anger to look at, at injustice, to, to, to look at people being alienated, to, 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 to look at people being exploited, to be, being abused. We should look at that and go, that is not how God intended us to live. And it makes me angry when someone who's created in the image of God treats another person who's created in the image of God in, in a, a horrible way. It, it, makes, it upsets me. And so be angry. And if you're trying to figure out, well, which one is that? Because on it, I am an angry person. Sometimes I just, I just wake up angry. I'm like, how do I know? Well, you can ask yourself the simple question. Is my motive to be right in this situation or to be righteous? Do I just want to be right? Do I, do I want to come across as a good standing citizen? Or do I want to be righteous? And then actually go, hey, actually, you know what? I'm actually not that righteous. I'm, let me point you to the one who is righteous, who's working his righteousness into my life. It's incredible. It's amazing. Let me tell you about Jesus. So be angry. And do not sin. Bring, br- bring your anger to the Lord. H- how do I not sin? Br- bring it to the Lord. And, and not, just, not just that situation, not just that injustice or, or that exploitation or, or that abuse. Don't, just, not just that, but, but you also need to bring yourself to the Lord. Because left to my own, who knows what I would do. If I don't bring the things that make me angry, and there's a lot of things that make me angry when I look at the world. If I don't bring those things to the Lord and bring myself to the Lord, friends, it is, it is, the, it is the quickest way to plant a gospel-centered disciple-making transcultural church in prison from within prison. I mean, that's 
it's a way of doing ministry, but I, I don't think that's God's plan. So bring it to the Lord. Bring, bring the situation. Bring, bring yourself to the Lord so that you might not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And don't give the devil an opportunity. Other translations say don't give the devil a foothold. Don't give him a foothold. You see, when we sin, when we allow sin to linger in our lives, when we practice sin, when we are disobedient to God, what we're doing is we're giving the devil a foothold in our lives. It's like going mountain climbing. Anyone gone mountain climbing? I, I, I want to say, say I'm not surprised, but at the same time, ethnically you are in. You know what I mean? No, no, no. But... But when you go mountain climbing, they'll, they'll tell you, like, listen, when you want to climb further and further, you, you need to make sure that you, you look for a place where you can put your foot in and really get a firm holding in there. See, when we open up our lives to sin, that's what we're allowing Satan to do. He's just getting in there. And when we continue, he gets comfortable there. You know, there's like a, there, there's a foothold where you're like, it's not quite like, I still need to make sure that like I'm holding on and I'm like, I need to be aware of where I am and I just, you know, because I'm not. And then there's like a place where you just go. In some places, you can even take your, you take your hands off. You'd be like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, I'm, this is me. And, and for some of us, that's where Satan is in your life. Paul says, "Don't, don't do that. Don't, don't be angry. Don't let, don't, don't, don't sin. Don't, 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 don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't, don't open up your life to Satan. Because if you do that, it won't be too long before you have a seat for Satan at your table. It won't be too long before Satan is now involved in your decision making, in your financial planning, in how you conduct your relationships. You no longer." Go to God's word so that your mind may be renewed, so that you might live a godly life. You're going, so how, how close can I get to the line without getting burnt? Like, like what does sex before marriage really mean? You know, like, because I'm, I mean, I'm married in my heart. So like, surely that's, you know, like our plan is to get married. We really love each other. So surely you're negotiating with the one that you have given a foothold to that should not have a place in your life. And if you want clarity, it's here in God's word. Let the thief no longer steal. Instead, he is to do honest work with his hands so that he has something to share with anyone in need. I love the New Living Translation. It says this, if you are a thief, I'm just giving time for you to figure out, am I a thief? Or what, have I stolen? Have I, what's, what's happened this past week? If you are a thief, quit stealing. Instead, I love this about the gospel. It goes, hey, don't do this. Now here's how you should live. It always does that. It always does that because you are owned by God. You belong to him. And so go to him. If you're trying to figure out how do I live my life, how do I handle my resources, how, how do I handle my emotions and my feelings and my sexuality, go to him because he's, he's, he's got a way. Quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good, hard work and then give generously to others in need. Whew. Give generously. This tells me that, that uh, the church should never be a place of, of ongoing need that is never met. Because before Jesus, before crossing the line of faith, all of us, are, all of us, all of us were thieves. All of us. Yeah, but I only stole. Yeah, but you stole. You're a thief. And, and it may not even be, <laughs> it may not even be like 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 things that you can touch and feel. Like you are. That, that, that breath that is in you does not belong to you. It belongs to God. Your life belongs to God. And so you cross the line of faith and you give everything to him and you, you begin to, to work and you begin to, why? So that I can give generously. Generously. And so I believe that there are many churches who, who folks have read that, I'm not a thief, I need to stop stealing I'm working hard. Oh, I'm putting in the work, huh? 
and then give generously. I don't know about that one. Because it's not, it's not my problem. Callous. It's not my issue. Callous. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Not just a callous, but a misunderstanding of the gospel. Verse 29, no foul language should come from your mouth, but only what is good for building up someone in need so it gives grace to those who hear. Some of us need to just spend some time with Jesus and and allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, renew our minds, and keep quiet. Some of us are way better at using our words to tear down people than to build them up. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not throwing judgment. I'm not, I'm not trying to be that guy. I recognize that, that many of us do this. We tear down others because we've been torn down. Hurt people hurt people. And so what do we need to do? We need to make our way, make our way to Jesus. The healer of healers. Let him first build you up. Spend some time Renew your mind. Work on your issues. Bring your pain to him. Let him heal so that I might be able to go and use my words to build up. You know, it's, it's crazy. We have this, 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 this practice where people go, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to press into community. I'm not going to plug in. I'm not going to, um, because I, I know I'm hurting. Thank you, Oni, for speaking to me this, this morning. I'm hurting. I'm in pain. Um, and so before I kind of step into all of this, uh, let me sort myself out first. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's, it's the same as so- someone who's just been in an accident. They're bleeding out and they go, you know what? I'm going to wait for the bleeding to stop before I go to the ER. You'd look at someone, you'd be like, you're insane. The, the, the church oftentimes is described as a hospital. Jesus himself says, I came for the sick. So, so, so we're not afraid. We're not afraid of what you're experiencing and the hurt and the pain that you're going through. Some of us, we go, you know, I, I don't want to because, guys, I'm, just, I'm going through some massive issues. I might cut some of you guys. It's okay. We're, we're gospel-saturated community. And so if you cut us, what bleeds? The gospel. So bring your pain. And even if I'm afraid of it, God is not. Because all I'm going to do is just point you to Jesus. Let's jump to verse 31. It says, Let all bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting, and slander be removed from you, along with all malice. I love how the Passion Translation puts it. It says, Lay aside bitter words. And bitter words come from bitter people. Temper tantrums. It's not just two-year-olds that have temper tantrums. CEOs can have temper tantrums. A pastor can have temper tantrums. Revenge, profanity, and insults lay aside. Those belong to a dead person. You are a new creation. You are alive in Christ. Don't live like that. Let's go back to verse 30, and then I'll end the plane at 32. He says, and don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed by him for the day of your redemption. Don't, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Now, now, sometimes this is hard to understand because it's like, how, how do we do that? How do I grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, to, to f- fully grasp this, uh, we first need to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. The Holy Spirit is not an it. He is a he. He is a divine person. He is part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so he is a divine person, but he's also fully God, just like Jesus. And so that means if he's a divine person, that it points to the fact that he has emotions. How do I grieve you? That's how you grieve the Holy Spirit. Have you ever been grieved? That's how you grieve the Holy Spirit. But, but let me try to flesh this out a little bit more to give more clarity. See, when we cross the line of faith, when you become a Christian, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is deposited into your life. He lives in you. And, and oftentimes he's described as, as a fire. Hebrews 12, 29 says he's a consuming fire. And so I like how other translations, uh, instead of saying do not grieve the Holy Spirit, they say don't quench the Spirit. 
To quench a fire is to suppress it. To not allow it to grow. We, we sing songs like this. Fan into flame. Fan into flame. The spirit that lives in me, I want it to grow. I want it, I want it to take over every part of my life. Fan into flame. But if we don't do that, we quench the spirit. We suppress it. Have you ever found yourself, th th there are the dead person's clothes. That, that's, that, that used to be me, but not me anymore. And you find yourself going, but it, you know, it looks nice. There's always something that just kind of goes, hey, don't go there. Don't go there. Don't respond to that DM. Don't, don't hang out with that group of people. Don't, don't, don't say what you're thinking. Don't respond. That's the Holy Spirit leading in your life. And, 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 and the more you renew your mind, the fanning, the flame, the fire, the consuming fire that lives in you, the louder that gets. You know that when you are on top of the mountain, it's like, oof, I hear him like he's right here. Things are going so good. I'm in God's word. I'm praying. I'm gathering with God's people. Life is great. I hear, I hear him so clearly. Like he, you just turn off the noise of the world and you tune into the frequency of the Holy Spirit. But there are times where you are in the valley. And, and times are hard. And you're going, you know, I just, the temptation is to, to do things for myself. The temptation is to accessorize with a dead person's clothes. And so you, you start looking, and all of a sudden, they, they look good. They look tempting. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. The Holy Spirit speaks to you. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't suppress. Allow Him to take over. That's what Paul means here. Yeah? Because you've been sealed. That's a promise. You've been sealed. You've been sealed, guys. In verse 32, it says, but instead, be kind and affectionate toward one another. And then he, he asks this question. He says, has God graciously forgiven you? If you've crossed the line of faith, your answer should be yes. Grac he has graciously forgiven me. God, because I, I, I oftentimes, I'll sit and I'll go, I, I'm just so blown away. I'll open up God's word, looking to study, and, uh, and I'll read one, one sentence, and I'll just be like, wow, God, what? Me? Me. I shouldn't, I shouldn't be here. I shouldn't. It's, it's crazy. When I, when I go to uh, some of my old mates from high school and I'll go to their weddings and still hang out with them, uh, God sent me on mission there. It's a whole story for another day. But like, they'll see me act and they'll see me talk and, and they'll be like, so, so Oni, this is you. <laughs> I'll be like, yeah. Like, but for real, for real, this is you. Yeah, man, this is me. Like, you believe this. I do. I do. I believe that, that God, who created everything that I see, sent his son to come and live the life I should have lived and died for me so that he could be reconciled back to me because God hates sin. And, and man, I know he's working in my life, but I still find myself doing the things I shouldn't be doing. And there's grace there. He graciously forgives me. I believe it. I believe it so much that, hey, can you sit down? Let's talk a little bit about it. H has, has God graciously forgiven you? Yes. Then graciously forgive one another in the depths of Christ's love. Communal. Communal. And so I, it, 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 it feels weird because it, it feels like this is just a continuation of Paul's words. And he's going to continue like this. I'm going to call up the band. But like he, he, he's just going to continue in this as we continue to read more of Ephesians, exposing the areas of darkness in our lives and going, guys, if you've crossed the line of faith, if you belong to Jesus, that's not how you should live. He's going to talk about it in the context of marriage. He's going to talk about it in the context of parenting. He's going to talk about it in the context of work. I mean, it, it's, it's all over the place. 
And it's just the Holy Spirit impacting us over and over and over and over again. My hope, my hope, my hope is that you would yield to him, that you would surrender it, that you would just lay it all down and go, you know what, take over. Because what I'm trying to do is not working. It's not working. It's not coming together. The things that I'm pouring myself into, they're not fulfilling me. They're not satisfying me. It's not enough. Do your work in me. And I plead, I plead, I, we pray often here at Rooted. I pray in my car on a Sunday here. I, uh, I pray when I get together with the guys at the back. And, and I have the same prayer. Uh, like if you've been coming for a while, you'll pick that up real quick. That okay, pray is the same uh, most times. And it's not because I'm not creative. Guys, I'm... <laughs> creativity. <laughs> but it's not because I, I pray the same prayer because I'm, I'm like, God, I just... I want you to do what you've done in me and in others with more people. One of the most frustrating things for me is that I don't possess the power to save people. I don't. And it frustrates me because sometimes I'll look at people and I'll go, man, I just... If you, if you knew the Father, if you knew about His overwhelming love for you, you don't have to live like this. You don't. Your marriage doesn't have to be like this. The same God who breathed into humanity and gave life is the same God who breathed into Jesus in the tomb and made Him alive. He can breathe into your marriage. He can breathe into your circumstances. I can't do that. So what do I do? I press into the gospel. Because it's there where I find my identity. And then I show up week in and week out and just teach this. This is why we preach verse by verse here at Rooted Fellowship. B because, friends, you, you don't need a really cool, creative, innovative, God who comes from my imagination. That's not what you need. You need a biblical revelation, Holy Spirit led, unpacking of who He is. And so we just preach this. And then we pray like crazy. We pray like crazy. What do you pray for? For a mega church? for resources, for money, for people to give. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. I'll tell, I'll tell the truth. I do. But what I actually pray for is, is for one more. God, just one more. What, 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 what you've done in my life, what, what you've done in the lives of those who I spend time with, those who, God, just, just give me one more. Just give us just one more. And then he saves someone. And, and then what? Then what do we do? We press into the gospel. We preach this and believe it. We pray like crazy. And then we say, God, one more. And one more. And one more. And you see this in the book of Acts. God's people just believing the gospel, believing his word, praying like crazy, living as they're supposed to. And what does God do? He just keeps adding and adding and adding, because it's not what we do. We don't add. So just one more. My hope is that that would become your prayer as well. Press into the gospel. Believe what he says, and then do it, and then pray like crazy for your family. Pray for one more. At your workplace, pray for one more. You're already there, pray for one more. In your circle of friends, you're there, Pray for one more and watch him work for his glory and for our joy. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you are still at work molding and shaping us to become more and more like your son Jesus. All of this by the power of the Spirit. 
And so God, I pray, I pray for those who are sitting here and, and maybe for the first time recognizing that they have not crossed the line of faith, that, that they don't belong to you, that they've tried, they've tried to do all these different things separated from you, trying to be obedient to you without being born again. Lord, I pray that you would use this as an opportunity to draw them to yourself. Soften their heart. Give them a heart transplant. Remove the heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. Lord, give us one more. One more. There are folks sitting here and they know that they have family members who don't believe, who've suppressed the truth, who are renewing their minds with the things of the world. Lord, I pray that they would Pray with boldness and courage for one more. At their workplace, in their neighborhood. Lord, I pray for those who have crossed the line of faith, but we find ourselves accessorizing with a dead person's clothes. Lord, I pray that you would reveal to us that we have no business in the tomb. No business in the tomb because it's empty. And if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. Many of us are here because what was once considered impossible has been made possible because of the finished work of Jesus. And so help us to live in light of your truth. Many of us today need to confess the accessories in our lives, whether it's lust or greed, bitterness, anger, help us to live in light of you. And God, would you stir it up in our hearts, a passion for your name, and that happens because we are fanning the flame that dwells in us. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord, because we are fanning the flame that dwells in us. We cry out to you in your beautiful name. Amen.